In the summer of 2016, Kevin Durant decided to take his talents to the Bay to play for the Golden State Warriors. Because of his decision along with trading away Serge Ibaka, the Oklahoma City Thunder entering the 2016-2017 season had a starting lineup that consisted of Westbrook, Oladipo, Roberson, Sabonis, and Adams. And with Oladipo and Sabonis viewed as bench players who were forced into the starting lineup, and Roberson and Adams were viewed as defensive role players, a narrative was quickly created that Russell Westbrook was going to have to carry this organization for them to see any type of success not only during the regular season, but hopefully during the postseason as well. Fast forward through the 2016-2017 season, and Russell Westbrook was able to accomplish something that had never been done over the last 50 years, which is average a triple-double, while averaging nearly 32 points, nearly 11 rebounds, and 10 assists. He was also credited to leading the Oklahoma City Thunder to a regular season record of 47-35, and, and because of his efforts, he was awarded the league's MVP. But despite his efforts, the Oklahoma City Thunder were still bouncing out in the first round by the Houston Rockets in five games. Now fast forward to the 2017 offseason and the Oklahoma City Thunder were able to pull off some moves that made their situation much more interesting when you look at their starting five. They were able to trade away Oladipo and Sabonis to the Indiana Pacers and in return they received Paul George and they also traded away Enos Cantor and Doug McDermott to the New York Knicks and in return they received Carmelo Anthony, building a big three that many people assume were going to be able to compete in a Western Conference. Now fast forward through the 2017-2018 season, and despite the fact that Russell Westbrook averaged a triple-double for the second consecutive season, despite the fact that Carmelo Anthony, Russell Westbrook, and Paul George played majority of the season and didn't suffer from any season-ending injuries, and despite the fact that this team was consistently given the benefit of the doubt, the Oklahoma City Thunder finished the 2017-2018 season with one more regular season win than the season prior and still was knocked out in the first round by a Utah Jazz team that was led by Rudy Gobert and a rookie in Donovan Mitchell in six games. Which means that the 2018 Oklahoma City Thunder must go down as the worst and most disappointing super team in NBA history. However, everything that I said still doesn't do it justice to how bad the Oklahoma City Thunder were this year and how disappointing it is for all three of the stars that played on this team. Y'all ain't met play on P yet, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so first, let's talk about Paul George, an eight-year veteran who saw a lot of success early on in his career as he was able to lead the Indiana Pacers to multiple conference finals appearances. But unfortunately for Paul George, the Indiana Pacers started to move in different directions. And because of the direction of the organization, many people viewed that to be the reason why the organization just didn't see as much success as they saw early on in Paul George's career. As PG in the last two years with the Indiana Pacers had a subpar record and was met with first round exits in the playoffs. However, and to be quite honest, no one really blamed Paul George for the lack of success from the organization as many people gave him the benefit of the doubt due to him being such a talented player in the NBA. So when the Indiana Pacers traded away Paul George to the Oklahoma City Thunder and in return they received Victor Oladipo and Sabonis, many people viewed that the Oklahoma City Thunder came out on top of that transaction. But here we are now six months down the line and that's not necessarily the case and it's for multiple reasons. During the 2017-2018 season, Paul George put a respectable stat line of 22 points, 6 rebounds, 3 assists, while shooting 43% from the field and 40% from behind the arc. So that really wasn't the problem with Paul George's season and why many people are questioning the player that Paul George is. However, ironically, the consistent theme with Paul George throughout the entire season was how inconsistent he was, as Paul George would have stretches that were amazing, but then he would still have stretches that were horrific, such as the last 25 games in a regular season where Paul George was shooting under 40% from the field and below 35% from behind the arc. But hey, it's Paul George, and just like his time in Indiana, he was given the benefit of the doubt despite the fact that he was struggling pretty significantly closer to the playoffs. And speaking of the playoffs, many people just assumed that he would start to ramp it up and be a more consistent option, especially when you have Russell Westbrook on the floor with you. But that didn't really happen either, which is definitely a massive problem when his primary assignment was Joe Ingles and he was given the responsibility down the stretch to defend a rookie in Donovan Mitchell. Now again, don't get me wrong, Paul George definitely had moments in games where he was amazing against the Utah Jazz in the first round, but he had just as many moments where he just disappeared completely, which is something that is unexplainable from a player that many people view as a top 10 to 15 athlete in the NBA. And obviously the one that many people are consistently highlighting is game six, 
where Paul George played 45 minutes, only recorded five points on two for 16 shooting from the field, 0 for six from behind the arc, and also recorded six turnovers. But the one thing that I will remember this series is a matchup between Paul George, excuse me, where are my manners, playoff P, and the rookie in Donovan Mitchell. Is that something that, that you're gonna take on a Garden Donovan for a Georgia position? Yeah, I'm used to it, I'm used to this. Y'all ain't met playoff P yet, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Y'all ain't met playoff P yet, huh? Y'all ain't met playoff P yet, huh? Yeah, I ain't met playoff P yet, huh? <laughs> With the sweet finger roll. Well, blow me over. That was embarrassing. And the reason why this is so glaring for me when it comes to Paul George is that I'm really starting to question how good of a player Paul George is in the NBA. Don't get me wrong, Paul George is still one of the better players in the league, he's one of the better two-way players, and I have no problem with him being on my roster. But when it comes to Paul George, due to the amount of talent that has entered the NBA since he started to take off in his early years in Indiana, such as Giannis, Joel Embiid, Ben Simmons, and I guess now Donovan Mitchell, it's starting to become harder for Paul George to solidify himself in the NBA with accolades that would push him into conversations to make the Hall of Fame. But what makes matters even worse is that, like I said before, we gave Paul George the benefit of the doubt when it comes to the lack of success from the Indiana Pacers over the last two years. However, Victor Oladipo, a player that many people viewed as a bench player, made his transition to the Indiana Pacers, posted up numbers that were very similar to Paul George while leading the Indiana Pacers to 48 wins. Which then makes me wonder, was it really the Indiana Pacers making poor decisions or is Paul George just not that impactful? Hey P, they said I gotta come off the bench. Next up we have Carmelo Anthony, the gift that keeps on giving. Carmelo Anthony, 15 year vet, spent his last few years playing with the New York Knicks. And entering the season, very similar to Paul George, Carmelo Anthony was pardoned the blame for the lack of success from the New York Knicks, simply because he didn't have enough help, the coaching was inadequate, and the organization from the front office and all the way down was completely dysfunctional. And you know what the funniest part about this? Is how quickly so many people are willing to change the narrative with Carmelo Anthony. Because let's go back real quick, because I know a lot of people have amnesia. Before the season began, if I'm not mistaken, please correct me if I'm wrong in the comment section below, but we were supposed to see Hoodie Mello. If I'm not mistaken, and again, correct me in the comment section below, when you put Carmelo Anthony on the same perimeter with two stars, we're going to see Olympic Mello. And when ESPN ranked him 64th in the NBA, wasn't there an uproar? But yet again, Carmelo Anthony, the gift that keeps on giving, continues to disappoint people. Because Carmelo Anthony ended the regular season averaging 16 points, 6 rebounds, on some of the worst shooting percentages of his career. Carmelo Anthony had a career low in points per game, career low in field goal percentage, career low in free throw percentage, and career low in true shooting percentage. Coming from a player that I was told, once he was given a lesser responsibility on the offensive end, he would be a much more consistent scoring option, however, that never happened. Matter of fact, as time continued to progress during the regular season, he got worse. But yet again, many people gave him the benefit of the doubt that once the playoffs began, that he would show up. But yet again, Carmelo Anthony, you know, that, that guy that keeps on giving me material year after year, yet again did not show up. But here are the two things that are eye-opening with Carmelo Anthony this year. Again, like I stated before, Carmelo Anthony was part in the blame of their lack of success from the New York Knicks, simply because of other entity that was out of his control. However, last year, the New York Knicks were only able to win 31 games. The year before that, they only won 32. 
But with Porzingis missing significant amount of games this year, along with Tim Hardaway, they only dropped two games, which more likely means that Carmelo Anthony indeed was a detriment to the growth and progression of Kristaps Porzingis. And this also means Carmelo Anthony for the last two to three years was indeed putting up empty stats. Scoring numbers that were not translating to wins, poor defensive effort that you were never going to get out of Carmelo Anthony regardless of the situation that he was placed in, and his inability to have self-awareness to aid his teammates in other aspects of the game of basketball. Which leads me to the second part that is extremely eye-opening of Carmelo Anthony. Because when Carmelo Anthony was prompted the question, not once, not twice, but three different times, to take a lesser role and come off the bench, Carmelo Anthony made it extremely clear just in case people in the back didn't hear. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sacrificing no bench role, so you can, that's out the question. And so when I see people in my comment section, on Twitter, or whatever platform you decide to utilize to voice your opinion about why I or other people do not like Carmelo Anthony, or why we have a disdain for Carmelo Anthony, or why we view Carmelo Anthony as overrated, I'm sorry, but I am not going to cape for someone who openly admits that he is not willing to sacrifice a starting role as he's entering the 16th year of his career as if anything that he will produce is worth starting over other players in the NBA. I'm going to shut that shit off next game, though. Guarantee that. And finally, we have Russell Westbrook. I save the best for last. A 10-year veteran coming off of a season where he was awarded the MVP as he averaged a triple-double. So, moving on into this year, it was extremely clear of the stakes that were at hand with Russell Westbrook in his career, as he had entered the realm of all-time excellence by winning the MVP along with averaging a triple-double, and the only thing that many people still question about Russell Westbrook was his ability to be an efficient player that leads to wins. And with Paul George being a free agent at the end of the season, and Carmelo Anthony accepting the third option on his team, it was Russell Westbrook's responsibility as the best player on this team to lead this team to as much success as they possibly could to convince Carmelo Anthony to accept his role and to convince Paul George to stay on his organization. But sadly, none of that happened. Russell Westbrook this season became the first player in NBA history to average a triple-double for his second year of his career. While Russell Westbrook averaged 25 points, 10 rebounds, and 10 assists, on 45% shooting from the field. But despite the fact that Westbrook averaged a triple-double, the Oklahoma City Thunder still struggled significantly to find some form of consistent way to win games. And so when the Oklahoma City Thunder finished his season with one more game in their win column than last year, you would believe, as the best player, that someone would throw some form of criticism his way. I mean, there's, there's no way that that is acceptable. But no. Yet again, Russell Westbrook was given the benefit of the doubt, and it was everyone else's fault, and Westbrook had to do everything. But heading into the playoffs, as the Oklahoma City Thunder matched up with the Utah Jazz, and the Jazz being a team led by Rudy Gobert and a rookie in Donovan Mitchell, everyone just assumed, even if Paul George isn't playing elite level, even if Carmelo Anthony is inactive on a defensive end, Russell Westbrook is such a great player and he dominates at multiple aspects of the game that he will be more than enough for them to get past the first round. But that did not happen. And the reason why it took me so long to make this video is because I wanted to see who was gonna make the excuses. I wanted to see who was gonna put that cape on for Russell Westbrook for another year and claim he was not part of the reason, if not the biggest reason, as he is the best player on his team, to why this team was unable to get past the first round for the second consecutive season. Because I don't care what anybody's gonna tell me, Russell Westbrook, even though he averaged 29 points, yet again he shot below 40% from the field. Even though Russell Westbrook recorded seven and a half assists, he turned the ball over five times a game. And even though, yes, people want to say, well, where was Paul George in game six? Russell Westbrook, he had to do everything he could in game six. I mean, that's the reason why Russell Westbrook field goal percentage was so low. But what about game two, where Russell Westbrook only scored 19 points, 13 assists, nine rebounds, three turnovers, four steals, and shot 37% from the field. But hey, I guess if he would have recorded one more rebound to get that triple-double, it would have erased a seven-point deficit. 
But lo, that's just one game, man. Give him a break. Okay, but what about game three? 14 points, 11 rebounds, 9 assists, 2 steals, 8 turnovers, and 29% shooting from the field. But doggone it, Russell Westbrook, if he recorded one more assist, then they definitely would have won that game. But then we move on to game four. The infamous, I'm going to lock down Ricky Rubio game. 23 points, 14 rebounds, 3 assists. However, turned the ball over 5 times and shot below 40% from the field. And Russell Westbrook finished that game with 5 fouls. And so yes, games 5 and game 6, it was miraculous and i even tend to defend russell westbrook in game six because paul george he just didn't show up that was that was ridiculous for paul george but to sit here and act like the first four games just didn't happen it's ridiculous so as you sit there and continue to lower the bar for russell westbrook and in my opinion i think this is disrespectful because i believe russell westbrook is intelligent enough he's capable enough to make the right decisions because a lot of these things are just common sense but as you sit there and you lower the bar for Russell Westbrook and you continue to make excuses to why he turns the ball over at a ridiculous rate and why he just can't seem to find a way to shoot at least 43% from the field in the postseason, I'm going to sit here and hold Russell Westbrook to the same level of accountability that we've held every other great player in NBA history. So when you put all of that into perspective, when it comes to the three best players, on the quote-unquote super team of the 2018 Oklahoma City Thunder, it is without a doubt that the 2017-2018 Oklahoma City Thunder will go down as the worst and most disappointing super team in NBA history.